Hey, welcome to Ridge Church Online this week. Glad that you're joining us. Two quick announcements before we jump into this week's sermon. Uh, first of all, we want to let you know, parents, uh, that uh, we our kids' night out for kids in elementary school age is going to happen. The next one is happening on Friday, April 26th, uh, 5 or 5.30 here at the church. Check the website for all the details. Register. Bring your kids. Have a nice evening out, the two of you. It's a win-win for everyone. Uh, you can find out more on the website. The other one that also for parents is this, that this summer, July 8th to 12th, we are having a soccer camp, a summer soccer camp in association with Athletes in Action. It's going to be a fabulous week. Your kids are going to love it. Uh, and so same thing, uh, information available on our website. Go there, uh, register, send your kids for a fabulous week with a bunch of other kids playing soccer and learning more about Jesus. Okay, that's what's coming up. Here's this week's sermon. Well, welcome today. So glad to have you here. Uh, in his letter to the church of the city of Philippi, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says this, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The Apostle Paul writes to these Christians in this church, and he says, Look, your citizenship and mind, the place where you ultimately belong is not here, it's in heaven. And he says, and we will experience that when Jesus returns to reclaim what is rightfully his own and bring it all under his control. And he says, and when that happens, he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. And if you were here last week, that's what we talked about. This idea that our bodies would be resurrection bodies, just like Jesus and his resurrection body. And so we talked about what kind of body Jesus had. Jesus had a physical, real body. One that ate and drank and walked and talked. And the same will be true for us. In eternity, we will remain who we are. We'll have the same history and appearance and memory and interests and skills. We won't simply become a bunch of, you know, cut out minions by the millions kind of standing next to each other. You will be you with your body. Now, for some of us, that makes us a little nervous to say, well, it, yeah, this body for all of eternity, I'm not sure this is the one I want to spend eternity in. Well, if that's you, don't worry, because the apostle also teaches us that your body will be the same, but different. He says that in heaven, uh, that your body will be imperishable, glorious. I've never really thought of this as glorious. It will be glorious, powerful. It will be the best version of your physical body. Because you see, when it comes to God's creation, when it comes to us, he doesn't scrap something and start over new. Rather, he is in the process of restoring and refreshing and renewing it back to its original design. And so Paul says, look, when we get to heaven, our bodies will become like Jesus' glorious body. And that, that's great news. And we hold to that. We, we believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's what we often say and sometimes sing in the songs that we sing. But often we have kind of a fuzzy view of what exactly does that mean? I mean, what are the ramifications of that very thing? If you are going to have a physical body for, <coughs> excuse me, for all of eternity, what are you going to do with it? Uh, where are you going to go with this physical body? Which brings us to what we're going to talk about today, to heaven and what heaven is like. You know, most people don't have a very good perception and often not even a biblical understanding of what heaven is all about. And as a result, most people, even many Christians, have a very deep ambivalence towards heaven. They, they know that they should want to go there, uh, but they're not really in a big rush to get there. And I understand that because that was me for many, many years. You know, I grew up going to church and I knew that heaven was a place that I would go when I would die. And I knew that I should be excited about it, but I secretly wasn't that excited about it. Because see, to me, heaven seemed like a very, very long church service. And I like church, obviously. But, but, but the idea of just going to a church service for, you know, singing for hour after hour with maybe a break for, a, you know, washroom break every once in a while, that just didn't really appeal to me. 
And apparently I'm not alone. Uh, John Eldridge writes this. He says this, nearly every Christian I've spoken with has some idea that heaven is an unending church service. Forever and ever? That's it? That's the good news? And then we sigh and feel guilty that we're not more spiritual. We lose heart and we turn once more to the present to find what life we can. That's actually what most Christians think heaven's about. And if that's what most Christians think heaven is about, then imagine, then imagine what those who aren't Christians think. They're even less excited about it. I mean, for example, there's this cartoon that uh, Gary Larson, who did The Far Side, uh, does. He, it's, a, it's, a, it's a guy sitting on a cloud with a halo and wings, and above his head is a little thing that says, you know, I wish I would have brought a magazine. I mean, this is the perception that heaven is clouds and angel wings and harps, and it is pretty boring, like, like, like doctor office waiting room boring. In fact, a number of years ago, McLean's magazine read an article about life after death and people's experiences. And, and the next issue, a guy named John Cocker from Stowfield, Stowville, Ontario, wrote this letter to the editor in response. Here's what he wrote. He said, do you realize that about a half million people die every day? So the entrance to heaven is like the customs line at Pearson International Airport after a thousand 747s have landed at once. Do we get an interview with God? And what are we going to be doing for eternity? I like boating and woodworking and flying, so I'm hoping this will be offered. If not, I'm not sure I want to go. Can you opt out? Are we just to talk among ourselves? I do not want to go. At least not unless I can see some sort of brochure first. <laughs> I love his honesty. I agree with you, John Cocker, from Stouffville, Ontario. If that's what heaven is like, I'm not sure I want to go either. If only there were a brochure that would tell us. Ah, but, but in fact, there is a brochure. It's called the Bible. And when you pay attention to what the Bible actually says about heaven... It paints a much different and a much more compelling picture of what heaven will actually be like. So that's what we want to do. We want to talk about what the Bible says heaven will actually be like. In the book of Revelation, right at the very end, the apostle John has a vision of what heaven is going to be like. And here's how he describes it. He says this, Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I looked, uh, 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 sorry, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So the apostle John has this vision and he looks to see what heaven is going to be like and, and he tells us two very important things about heaven. The first is this. He tells us that there will be a new heaven and a new earth because he says the first heaven and the first earth will have passed away. Now, it's easy to skip over that because, you know, we read it says, but it's incredibly important because here's what John is saying. He is saying that you and I will spend eternity here on earth, on this earth. It will be a new earth and we will spend it here in our physical resurrected bodies, the ones that sleep and, and eat and walk and talk. Now, you might be saying, huh, this earth? Yeah, that's what he says. He says it will be this earth, only new, right? I mean, look, if I tell you, hey, I'm going to get you a new car, you don't say, oh, a new car. Oh, so that means it won't have an engine, it won't have a steering wheel, it won't have wheels, and it won't have doors, so that's a new car. Of course not. You know, a new car is the same as the old car, only better, only newer. Right? And that's what uh, the apostle John is saying. In the same way, the new earth will be a better vision of the old earth, just as our resurrection bodies will be a bit better versions of the one that we have right now. It'll be the same but different. Continuity but transformation. What God is going to do for our bodies, he's going to do for this earth. 
But sometimes people say, yeah, but I thought God was going to destroy the earth. Isn't he going to burn it up with fire? Isn't that what the Bible says? I mean, how can we have a new earth? And, and the passage that they're thinking about is a passage out of the book of uh, 2 Peter. And here's what, here's what they're referring to. Here's what it write, he writes. He says, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing. And following their own evil desires, they will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. He says, look, in the end times, people are going to say, oh, Jesus is coming back, huh? Huh, What kind of a dream world are you living in? It's just the same as it's always been. Peter says, yeah, but this is what he writes next. They, They deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. He says, yeah, but they forget. They forget that God created the earth. And then, even though he newly created it, he, he flooded. He sent Noah's flood, right? The, the, the flood that destroyed the earth. And he says, in that time, people mocked too. They said, oh, Noah, nice boat you're building. It's a pretty big boat. What exactly are you doing? Because uh, nothing happened in here. And in fact, the flood comes and it destroys the earth, right? But that didn't mean that the earth ceased to exist. It meant that God wiped it clean. He he purified it so that it could start over, so that there would be, so that righteousness could flourish on it again. That's the picture. And then Peter says this, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. In other words, he says, just as the flood came and destroyed, the day is coming when fire will come and destroy. And then he says this, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. In other words, just like the flood happened, the fire is going to destroy. But in the same way, it isn't going to destroy so that the earth is this, this burned out husk that is abandoned. It's going to be purified renewed, made new, so that righteousness can flourish once again. That's why the very next words that the Apostle Peter writes is this, but in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. You see, in the end, God is going to renew the earth, which will be where we spend eternity because that's what God does. You see, often when it comes to heaven, when it comes to the end times, Christians have a kind of lifeboat theology. In other words, they understand the the story of the Bible to go something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. I mean, he did a fine job. And then he created human beings with with a body and a soul and a spirit together in one. And when he created us, he said, wow, that's very Very good. But then the devil saw it and he said, I'm going to go and mess that stuff up. And so he he tempted Adam and Eve and they chose to sin and we've all sinned ever since. And therefore God sent his son Jesus to suffer and to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins so that we might be made right with God. But but even as he is in the process of saving us and and giving us new life, him, God and and the devil are in this huge battle for his creation. And the devil is slowly but surely winning. I mean, just look around you. Everything is getting worse. The the, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, it's just getting worse and worse. And so God is fighting this this courageous rear guard action. He's kind of like gathering people up, saying, okay, come here. You you hunker down in your churches. Just wait there while everything bad happens out here. And then at the end, then at the end, he sends a lifeboat. The, the rescue pod, and we get on it and we blast away from earth. And, and as we do, we look through the windows and we see this place that we love is on fire and it's burning up. And we say, oh, we love that place. But, 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 God, but God is whisking us away to heaven. And, and, and God may have lost the battle for his creation, for the earth, but he is going to take us and we're going to start over in this new place that, that uh, you know, that is intangible and kind of utterly unfamiliar to us, uh, the opposite of anything we know. And, and the devil will be, you know, the devil will be defeated. Ultimately, the devil will be fe- defeated. But 
He won this battle and the earth is kind of done. In other words, he gave God this huge sort of bloody nose, but in the end he'll be defeated. Right? I mean, that's kind of the subtext of a lot of what we hear about the end times, isn't it? About what we hear about heaven. But it's not accurate. And God has never given up on his original creation. God will never lose to Satan. What he created was good and very good, and he is not about to abandon it. He's not about to whisk us away to spend an eternity floating in the air in some place that's totally unfamiliar to us. Instead, he's going to restore his creation back to the way that he always meant it to be. This is the language that runs through the Bible. If you look for it, you could hardly miss it. Reconcile, redeem, restore, recover, return, renew, regenerate, resurrect. That's what God is doing. And creation waits for it. Creation longs for it. Listen to what the, how the apostle describes it. He says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but by him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay, de decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. See that? Creation longs for the same kind of resurrection that you and I are going to have. It longs to be renewed and restored to the way that God always intended it to be. And Paul goes on to describe what it'll be like for creation. He says, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Creation is waiting for the same kind of redemption, the same kind of resurrection that we are. And it will happen when Jesus returns. But people, but you might say, yeah, but, but what about the rapture? I mean, d doesn't God whisk us away to spend some time in heaven while he destroys the earth? No, no, not necessarily. The, the very idea that Jesus is going to rapture us out of this earth is a relatively new idea in Christian history. It, it was only ever first introduced as a concept in the, in the early 1800s by a man named John Nelson Darby. Before that, nobody in the entire history of Christianity thought that we would be raptured off of this earth. It, it simply wasn't thought to be the case. But you might say, yeah, but... But doesn't the Bible say that we'll be taken up to meet Jesus into the air? In the air? Yeah, it does. In fact, here's exactly what it says. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. That's what it says. Paul explains that when Jesus returns, it will be the day of resurrection. For the dead, and then, of course, for those who are still alive. It will also be the day when eternity begins, because that's what he says. We will be with the Lord forever. And he isn't going to loop around and pick us up to go back to, to, to some other place for, you know, a couple of years while the earth burns up so that then he can return a second time. He's only coming back once to finally reclaim all that is rightfully his. And he's returning as a triumphant king. You remember, you remember the first time when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, right? He, it was called the triumphal entry. He, he rode on a donkey and the people that were with him, what did they do? They, they put cloaks on the ground and, and palm branches and they sang Hosanna and they, and they escorted Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. And he came so humbly on a donkey. 
But this time when Jesus returns, he's going to come as a mighty king, come back to reclaim and restore his rightful reign and rule over this earth. And you have to understand that in the ancient world, when a, when a king went off to battle somewhere or, or on a long trip, when he came back to his home, the people of that city didn't just sit around their homes, you know, working on whatever they were working while he slunk quietly into town. Not at all. They went out to greet him. They, they went out to meet him as he came in. And, and they would come up to sing his praises and to bow down in honor towards him and to celebrate his victories. And they would escort him into the city. That's the picture that Paul is using when he describes Jesus' return. On the day when he returns, when Jesus returns, if you're still alive, you're not going to be sitting in your living room, you know, scrolling your Instagram feed and say, oh, cool, Jesus is back. Look at that. Oh, look at this. Right? I mean, you're not. You're going to join literally hundreds of millions of people who, who go out to meet Jesus, who rise to meet Jesus in the air. Not to be zoomed out of here, but to escort him back in to be the rightful ruler and reigner, the king of the world. He's not going to, he, 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 yeah, that's what's going to happen. Now, that's going to fire some of you up. And that's okay. That's okay. Look, this is not a hill to die on. But I think if you look carefully what it says, that you will come to see that there is no life boat theology for God. He will be utterly victorious when he returns. So let's go back and review what we've learned so far about heaven. The apostle Paul says that in the end, when Jesus returns, that he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And then he adds this, and there was no longer any sea. In eternity, there will be a new improved earth. And to indicate that, John says that there will no longer be any sea. Now, what he's not saying is that in the new earth, uh, there will be like these giant, empty, dry holes where there once was the oceans. Not at all. The oceans are one of the marvelous creations of God. Instead, in the ancient world, the sea represented chaos. It represented danger and destruction and storms. And the apostle John is telling us that in the new heaven and the earth, new earth, there will be no more chaos. There'll be no more hurricanes, no more earthquakes, no more tornadoes or forest fires, no more chaos. The earth will be at peace with itself, at peace in the world. And not just nature will be restored, so will relationships. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. All things will be made new. So this is the first thing that John tells us, that there will be a new earth. But then here's the second thing that he says. He says this, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. The second thing that happens is that heaven, where God currently dwells, will descend to earth. Heaven and earth will fuse into one. God himself will come and dwell here on earth with us. Like he did in the beginning when he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. We're going to have that kind of a relationship with God. Why? Because he's going to restore all things back to the way that he always intended them to be before sin and death brought such destruction to it all. It's an incredible picture that the Bible paints of what heaven will be like. You and I, if we're followers of Jesus, will spend eternity on this earth redeemed and renewed without any of the ravages of sin and death in a new, imperishable, glorious, powerful physical body and God will dwell here in the midst of us. That's what heaven will be like. Now, if that's the case, that has some pretty profound implications for us, both for when we're in heaven and for right now. So let's start with the implications for eternity. The first implication of that is this. We will eat in heaven. You like eating? Because I know I do. And we will, we will eat good food. We will feast like kings. 
Uh, I mean, I don't know this part for sure, but I doubt that there's going to be a McDonald's in heaven because that's hardly edible. And the food in heaven is going to be so good. And we're going to drink coffee. You, you know, it's been years since I've been able to drink coffee with caffeine. And, and when I get to heaven, I'm going to drink the richest, boldest, smoothest cup of coffee every day. In fact, if I can, a couple of times a day. And we'll drink good wine. And we'll be able to travel. You know, I have always wanted to go to South Africa. I think it's got to be one of the most beautiful, amazing places in the world. And if I get the chance to go in this lifetime, I will. But if I don't, then in the lifetime to come, in eternity, I'm going to go to South Africa. And I'm going to hike. And I'm going to explore. And I'm going to spend a good bit of my time in that part of the world. And don't get the impression that you're going to spend eternity running around in a garden with a couple of fig leaves covering, you know, your important parts there. Not all. A theologian, Cornelius Venema, explains why. He says, every legitimate and excellent fruit of human culture will be carried into and contribute to the splendor of life in the new creation. In other words... All of the technological advances of human that humanity has made, all that contribute to what is good and right and beautiful, will be in the new heavens and the new earth. There will be cities, beautiful, thriving cities. There will be bullet trains and IMAX theaters and motorcycles and all kinds of things that we enjoy these days. And there will be culture. We will watch great movies. We will go to amazing concerts. We, we will watch, uh, we will, uh, you know, be, see incredible Broadway shows. We'll listen to the symphony orchestra. And everything will continue to progress. We won't just sort of stop in time. We'll continue. Why? Because God created us in, in his image and he's a creative God. And he imbued this, this planet, this earth with untapped potential so that there will be things and technology that we will have that you can't begin to imagine even now. Just like your great grandparents could hardly conceive of a telephone, much less a cell phone, much less a smartphone that gives you access to the worldwide internet. Architects will build new buildings Scientists will discover new technology. Engineers will design new products. Composers will compose new music that will make Beethoven sound like child play. There will be better poetry, better drama, better novels, and all without the twisting and the destruction that comes from the ravages of sin and death. And all of it will bring glory to God the way he always intended it to be. And will work. But our work will be perfect for each of us, adapted to each of our individual giftings. It'll be kind of, you will do the kind of work that God created you to do, the, the, the kind of work that you do best. And it won't be frustrating or fruitless, but it will be deeply fulfilling. I don't know if this has ever been a case for you, but, but maybe. Has there ever been a time in your life, in your work, where you've got up and you're kind of excited to go to work? You're like, what we're doing at work is like, is, is, is it really effective and, and, and fruitful and, and, and it's making a difference. I mean, you, and you're like kind of excited to go. That's how it'll feel for work every day in heaven. That's the way God always intended it to be. And of course, we'll play sports. I mean, in heaven, I'm pretty sure that the Green Bay Packers will always beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. Okay, that part I'm not sure about. But I, I am sure that we will play sports. And we'll hang out with friends. And we'll tell stories and laugh until our guts hurt. And we'll sit around campfires and go camping and, and go to shows. And, and if, you're a, if you're like, uh, oh, where did it go? Uh, John Cocker from Stouffville, Ontario. And you who wanted to see the bro brochure before he goes. If you really want, there will be woodworking and boating and flying too. In the midst of it all, God himself dwelling among his people like he did in the Garden of Eden before the first humans rebelled against him. In the midst of it all, we will worship God and it will not be boring in the least. When we gather to worship him, it will make the greatest concert you'd ever been to. It'll make the, the greatest concerto by Beethoven or Mozart that you've ever heard. It'll make it sound like a grade seven band practice. And I've heard that. That's what heaven's going to be like. 
For those who put their trust in Jesus, that's the end point. That's the goal. That's the ultimate destination. And for some of you are saying, yeah, I know all this. But for most of you, I'm guessing this blows your mind. It's just never been explained to you what the Bible actually says. I know it blew my mind when I first came to understand it. It was so unlike my hazy, weak caricature of what heaven would be like. And it was all so exciting because, see, that's a place I'd be happy to go. I mean, I, I, it will be like here, only better, only without all of the brokenness and the sin in this world. It will be literally heaven on earth. And I could have spent an eternity in a place like that. I mean, th there are all sorts of things that I want to do. Someday, I would love to be a farmer. It ain't going to happen in this life, but in the life to come, I'd love to spend a chunk of my time farming. And, and I'd also like to try my hand at being an architect. I think that would be really cool to do. And I've spent my whole life living in this corner of the earth, which has been so beautiful. I mean, I, I love it here. But I'm going to spend a bunch of my time exploring all the corners of this earth because there's so much beauty out there to see. And I'm going to meet all kinds of interesting and fascinating people. And I'm going to reconnect with family and friends who have passed away. And I'm going to eat fine, fine food. Look, if you don't have a good theology of heaven, you should develop a good theology of heaven. The book that changed my perspective, which lays it out a million times better than I have this morning, is a book simply called Heaven by Randy Elkhorn. It's well worth the read. It's kind of, it's a, it's a bigger book, but it is fascinating. C.S. Lewis also wrote a fair bit about heaven. And there are others, of course. And of course, you should study your Bible. Open your eyes to read what it says in light of what you've learned today. You should develop a strong theology, a strong understanding of heaven. And here's why. And this is what we're going to talk about next week. When you truly understand what heaven is about, it profoundly changes how you live your life here and now in the present. If you want to get the most out of this life that you have right now, the most fulfillment, the, the most sense of joy and peace and contentment, then a strong biblical understanding of what heaven is all about is the place to start. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. So make sure that you join us next week. All right. Well, that should leave you with lots to ponder, lots to think about. But it's what the Bible teaches. And it feels much better, doesn't it? Much better than clouds and harps and angel wings. And it makes better sense. It fits with the grand picture of what God is doing. It is the ultimate fulfillment and completion of the message of the gospel. And so therefore, it should cause us to worship. It should cause us to live our lives in light of eternity. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Well, God, we, we come to you today. We thank you for your word. Your word that is much richer and much deeper than anything that we can sort of imagine or contemplate on our own. You know, a word, God, that shows us what you have in store for us. Something so beautiful. Something so amazing something so inviting. God, open our eyes to see and to understand what heaven will be like. To understand what it is that, that you have prepared for those of us who love you and who are called according to your purposes. Oh God, would you prepare our hearts for that? And would you help us as we live in light of that? God, we bless you. We thank you for what Jesus has done and what he is doing and the fact that we will spend eternity with you and him in the new heavens and the new earth. We praise you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming and, and joining us today. I hope that, that today has been deeply encouraging for you, maybe eye-opening for you, maybe challenging you in some ways. I just encourage you, go back, read the Bible, see what it says, and find out what God actually has to say about heaven. Let me send you out with these words. The Apostle Paul writes at the beginning of the book of Corinthians. He's writing about who God is and how he is. And he says this, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. May we walk in light of what God reveals to us through his word. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. See you next week. 
Well, hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridge Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that it was just a great opportunity for you to connect and learn more about following God and knowing Jesus. And we just want to invite you to continue to engage with us here. But we also believe that one of the best ways to follow Jesus is in the context of community. And so let me just take a quick moment and tell you what Ridge Church is all about. We're really about three things. The first thing is about Jesus. Above all, uh, Jesus is the reason for, that we exist. Our goal, our desire is that you would know Jesus and be known by Jesus and that he would change and transform your life. The second, we believe that community is really important. You know, in a world with so many digital connections and so few genuine connections, we believe that one of the best ways to live life, one of the most healthy ways, and certainly one of the, the, the ways to follow Jesus best is in the context of community. And so regardless of what stage of life you're in or uh, where you're at in your spiritual journey, we want to invite you to come and to join us and to walk with a few others, to be known by them and to know them as we follow Jesus together. And then thirdly, we're about city. And by that, we mean that we want to be a place and a people who love our city, who love our neighbors and serve them and care for them and just walk alongside of them so that our city flourishes. And we want to be known by our city as a group of people, as a church that offers hope and life and care and love to anyone who's looking for that kind of thing. So that's really what we're all about. Jesus, community, and city. And we'd love to have you join us. If you want to know more, just fire off an email to hello at ridgechurch.ca and someone will get back to you. Or better yet, just come by for a service, 10.30 Sunday mornings. Look forward to seeing you soon.